Flight uh, 4 is the last of our flight test programs. This shot of the underside of the vehicle stacked on the pad. Uh, one of the most significant things at this point is that we turn this vehicle around from one flight to the next in something on the order of three months. That kind of a turnaround rate was done in spite of the fact that we had all of the scrutiny and all of the thoroughness of a flight test program, and yet that same rate will carry us through the ops era for the next couple of years. You see a couple of cats in a pressure suit. This is also the last time that you'll see anybody wearing a pressure suit or using ejection seats. From now on, we're going to be going in shirt sleeve environments. Come out to the launch pad. One of the things we did here was to, as Hank mentions, we get ignition on time, much less than a second off the planned trajectory. Here you see the engines coming up to speed. The engines are controlled in the final count by the onboard computers. We verify that we have good main engines prior to ignition of the solids, which commits you to flight. Just prior to this, uh, we had uh, loaded the payload on the pad, which is another first for this part of our, of our mission. And that's going to be one of the ways we streamline the turnaround time for future operations. What you're watching now are pictures that show the umbilicals coming away from the tanks. These are the ones that are used to keep the tanks topped off keep them full, and as a way of controlling the venting. Here the spacecraft is lifting off, going past the tower. Throughout this part of the ride, from this point on, you're looking out uh, Hank's window as we do our roll down range. This is the vehicle turning. It launches with its tail to the south, and then we roll to pick up whatever launch azimuth we need, in our case, a 28 and a half degree inclination orbit. Throughout this part of the mission, uh, I was very impressed that the ride on the shuttle is much like it was in the Saturn. One of the major advantages or, or differences, I would say, is that you have more acceleration getting away from the pad and the vibration levels are reduced. We see the vehicle here going through approximately Mach 1. You'll notice that the shock waves start to build up around the nose of the vehicle and the tanks. You can see that quite vividly. We're somewhere over 20,000 feet now and uh, speed's building very rapidly. This is the region of maximum dynamic pressure. Here's a view taken from the pilot's window as we pop through the atmosphere. It's very dramatic as you get out of the atmosphere and the sky begins to turn dark very rapidly. Eight and a half minutes from liftoff, we're some 58 nautical miles high and uh, traveling at just under 26,000 feet per second. Here's a view taken in orbit as we do one of the Ohm's burns that I described to you earlier. We did uh, two of these burns to get into the 130 mile orbit, two more to jack the altitude up to 160, then a fifth one to adjust the entry roll phasing. Here's a just brief look at the operation of the continuous flow electrophoresis system. This is a prime example of an experiment or an, or an operation that can only be performed in zero-g efficiently. It must have the space environment. The principle of operation is that biological materials assume their own inherent charge in the presence of an electric field, and that serves as a basis for separating these materials. This can only be done now in the laboratory in only very small quantities of of biological materials that can be used in the treatment of disease can be separated in this fashion. It could be done with a static device, but to increase the yields, you need continuous flow. The principle being to put the biological materials in solution, pass them between the electrodes of an electric field. The, the, the molecules with a larger charge would then have the largest lateral displace, displacement in the field as the flow proceeded. Now, the big enemy of doing this on Earth is gravity. Gravity limits how much or how concentrated the solution is with the materials you're trying to separate because the solution must keep it in, must hold it up, and in gravity, uh, if you get the concentration too high, it won't hold it. Gravity also plays a part in convection. As the fluid is heated by the electric field, convection currents set up, which destroy the 
purity of the sample being gathered and also affects the quantity that you can uh, separate. In the space environment, you can increase the yield several hundred times over what you can do on Earth. And this is extremely important because then this allows us to, to generate clinical quantities rather than just experimental quantities. The big factor here is the cost. To produce the same amount of material on Earth as we can produce in orbit under a comparable period of time would cost a fortune. So space use of this type of device is going to reduce the cost and make the materials available. This is the first of six flights flying this device under a joint agreement between NASA and the contractor. Our first results show that this device worked very well and the results are very promising. In the future, we may very well have factories producing biological materials using this same technique. And again, I say the importance is that it can only be done in a space environment where there's no gravity or very little gravity. The device is run, a little microcomputer. Here we see the pilot uh, making an input into that computer. Here's a shot of an upfire in jet and side fire in jets. This is the kind of firings we took the data on, as I told you, with the plume survey. There's one of the small Vernier jets firing. We took that picture from the elbow camera on the RMS. The RMS was utilized in, in two days of our flight. The RMS is a sophisticated device. It works very much like your own arm, in which the brain computes the drive rates for the different joints to make the arm do what you want it to do. In the same fashion, the computer computes the rate to which to drive the arm. Here we see an example of how you can roll a payload about its own longitudinal axis, yet not make it translate. You can do the same thing in similar fashion by causing the payload to go up and down with respect to the orbiter, or we can make the payload go back and forth parallel to the own axes, as you see here, without rotating the payload. So it's a very versatile and useful tool. This is a, an example of donning the lower torso of a spacesuit. Uh, I'm wearing a liquid cooled garment that provides cooling when you're outside. The pictures are taken inside an airlock that's in the back of the, of the spacecraft cabin on the mid deck. The airlock is something we've never had before. It allows you to go inside and the hatch you're looking at uh, is an exit into the payload bay where you have the vacuum of space. Inside, you can go in in a shirt sleeve environment, don the suit, check it out, and then translate outside without having to depress the major part of the cabin. The purpose for this exercise in STS-4 was to prove that we had uh, good mobility inside the airlock. And you've just seen me put my feet in a set of stirrups that are going to anchor my feet so that I can simulate opening the hatch into the payload bay. This was in preparation for STS-5, where Two crew members will come inside, close off from the cabin, depress the airlock, and go outside to perform an EVA. Here's one of the prime reasons we go into space. <laughs> Not to have fun, but the presence of zero gravity. Imagine the applications of this. We've already talked about one, the CEPAS, in which we use the lack of gravity to do something very useful in, in technology and, and production. But you could also use this to, say, process materials in which it's important that the materials not touch a container with which uh, it's in. Lack of gravity also has some disadvantages in that you must somehow anchor yourself if you want to work in space. Here, the crewman puts his toes under the edges of the locker and notice he has quite a bit of freedom, freedom then to move about without coming loose and floating around as you saw earlier. Another device we evaluated was this little foot loop that he's put his foot in. Just a little loop, hooks his foot under it, and then he's able to make some movements. A third device we looked at are these little sandals with suction cups on the bottom. We evaluated this uh, for several days during the flight and found them to be uh, to very useful. 
Uh, we probably still need to do a little more development on them, but the concept, <laughs> concept is sound. One of the devices we liked the most on flight for improving morale was a treadmill. It works just, exercise works in space just like it does on, on Earth. It clears your thoughts and makes you ready to charge again. We had a harness that attached to the lower torso, and those bungee cords there applied a force equal to the body weight. So your legs were seeing the same forces they would see in one G on the surface of the Earth. We also had a, an electronic device to run off a battery you could attach to your earlobe. was also attached to the treadmill. You could tell what your heart rate was, uh, how far you'd gone, how long you'd been running. This was a, a, a real morale builder for our flight, to be able to use this. One of the things we took a look at in our operational evaluation was some revised packaging of the food system. In order to save weight and space on the spacecraft, uh, we have gone to dehydrating the food, putting it in some plastic containers. Now, Hank is on the left side of the picture putting water in to hydrate it. Uh, you mix it up. Since most food tastes better if it's warm or if it's cold rather than ambient, we have this uh, aluminum thing that looks like a suitcase. It's actually a little portable heater. Put the food that has to be warmed in there, and then we'll put it off to the side for uh, 15 or 20 minutes and let it warm up. At the same time, we had a little refrigerator, which we carried for the first time in this flight. Then we could put uh, beverages and things in there that would be cooled. And uh, you put it all together so that you have a hot meal with cool beverages and it goes a long ways towards making the food a lot more flavorful and just as it does on Earth, having a good meal does a lot to bring up morale and when you're working 15 and 16 hour days, that's important. This is a picture taken with a television camera in the moonlit night. Now the little dots you see off on the right side of the picture are stars. The white area you see in the center and left is the earth that's a cloud cover and the white line that you see off to the top at first looks like the earth's horizon however we noticed some stars that went right through the horizon and came down on the earth and uh, before admitting we'd lost our marbles uh, we observed it some more and determined that no what we're really seeing is the top of the earth's atmosphere it's about 90 kilometers up and that's one of the reasons that scientists would like to take their telescopes outside into space so that they can avoid having to look through that layer. And you can see two little stars in the top left corner of the picture that are just now about to go down and penetrate, and they're hidden by the Earth. And that shows you that that really is the Earth's limb. This is a picture taken at sunset, and as I keep pointing out, the pictures that we see are never as vivid as what you see in the real world. We found the, the colors to be brilliant reds and blues, and they change with latitude and longitude as you go around the Earth. I think it gives you a chance to, to observe things. I think you can see the amount of aerosol, like dust and volcanic ash that's in the atmosphere as it shows up and changes the colors. This is a picture taken at hypersonic speed with a telescope on the California coast. I think that's an illustration of the precision with which our system, both the the spacecraft and the ground have been able to pull off an entry. The entry was uh, very similar to what we've had in the past. The one difference between this and the ballistic approaches is that now you have time to experience the transition between 0G and 1G. Here's a picture taken out of the commander's window as he turns left, coming around on the lake bed. In the center right part of the window is the runway that was used on the lake bed for landing STS-1 and 2. We're turning on around and coming in towards the hard surface runway at the Edwards Air Force Base. I think it's uh, rather significant that in spite of the fact that a uh, pilot may experience a certain amount of vertigo and the transition to 1G uh, weight effects, but in spite of all that, the system with its information and the training program we have allows you to make a landing that looks like this, which is perfectly routine. We've just passed over the aim point. We're pulling up the nose, and here's where the gear comes down. Now you can see the runway approaching, and from this point on, you just sort of hold everything steady as you come up, check that the gear is down. It's always a good plan. 
<laughs> Next thing you do is you come up on the runway, and if you look closely, I think you can see touchdown as it occurs right about there. Here's an outside view of the same thing. Chase plane over on the left side of the screen. The gear is coming down. And this thing flies just as solid as a rock. <laughs> Approaching the overrun now. It'll touch down at about 1,000 feet down the runway at about 195 knots. About this point, Hank calls out that we have 185 and it's time to drop the nose. You can see the elevator is wiggling as it controls the rate of the nose coming down. Speed brakes are open, and now we perform a braking test where we try to hold about nine foot per second deceleration. I think the fact that we can go out and do all of this in public is a real tribute to our entire system. And at the end of the day, probably the most spectacular part is the flight of Challenger on its way to join a fleet. And we're no longer going to be a one-ship airline. This is the ascent. Uh, liftoff for those of you who weren't fortunate enough to be there. Uh, very fortunate from our standpoint, but I understand from the folks on the <coughs> ground, it was one of the clearer days we've ever had in Florida. When when the solids get a hold of you right here, you know you're going where those solids want to go, and you hope that something keeps them pointed in the right direction because you're on your way. The role, as reported before, was not disconcerting or confusing in any way. You know, that, that's about uh, a 90-degree roll there as soon as you clear the pad. As Bo said, we were kind of prepared for more shaking and clattering and vibration than we actually had. We're approaching SRB SEP here. You can see tail off. There are the set motors, and uh, as I say, those cause it to fall away in the right direction. So this is a view of the uh, of the tra tracking and data relay satellite in the bay. This is as we were elevating it from the stowed position to the 29 degree checkout position. It moved, uh, a phrase I used earlier in the, uh, with management today was that thing just moved majestically. It uh, is quietly, silently, as a matter of fact, and almost inexorably goes about its, its thing. This is a, as it was moving up toward the final attitude. 45 degrees, you can see on our protractor, that was our minimum elevation angle. Once it got to 45, if everything else was okay, that thing was going, whether we got to 58 or not. Now, that's the nozzle of the solid rocket motor, and this is the instant of separation. As Don said, we really had to kind of check the television view from this aspect to see that it was, in fact, deployed. Absolutely perfect deployment mechanically. It came straight out of the ASC, the Airborne Support Equipment, with no rates, just at, uh, again, at its four tenths of a foot a second, which isn't all that fast. And now, at about a minute after deploy, as we thrust backward toward it, and you're not sure the thing is really clear of the orbiter, but that does cause you to pitch down also or away from the thing. But it, nevertheless, it gets its attention when you're thrusting back toward a 17 or 18 ton piece of metal in the sky. <coughs> the white part is the IUS, the, the inertial upper stage. Here's where we started to, uh, to thrust toward it and pitch down.
This is the FCS flight control system checkout. We do it uh, every flight on the vehicle. That uh, is story operating the camera to take data for the uh, continuous flow electrophoresis system experiment. This is once a joint venture between McDonnell Douglas and Johnson and Johnson, which they have every confidence is going to have direct earthborne application very shortly. He's, uh, he was taking some photos of the, the streams up there and down here. He's uh, getting ready to change out some samples. Don was basically, uh, he was the housekeeper, and you can see that he kept a, a nice, neat ship down here. You know, there's not a lot of trash and equipment and items hanging on the uh, lockers and on the bulkhead, and, and that really helped a lot. And this was flight day two here, while uh, Bo was telling the world about the uh, getaway specials. They were mounted in those three canisters. We did a antenna test, which necessitated us getting crossways to our velocity vector and then rolling at two degrees a second. We took some pictures of it, and I'll tell you, it was a little more impressive from on board than it is here. But nevertheless, it was a, uh, a welcome diversion from just going around the world with a payload bay facing the earth all the time. This was on EVA day. That's uh, Story and Don in the airlock beginning their pre-breathe. You know, requires three and a half hours of pre-breathe on 100% oxygen <laughs> to make sure or to have better assurances that we've flushed nitrogen out of the system so folks don't get the bends when they're exposed to the lower pressures in the suit. Bo was cleaning up the airlock and uh, making sure that everything was ready for him. This photo was taken through a, uh, no, this is from the aft TV cameras. That's the airlock hatch being opened in preparation for airlock egress. And this is story like a, uh, a butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. I'll discuss the uh, extra vehicle activity or the spacewalk. The thing we wanted to test and evaluate there was our ability to do construction type work, repair type work in the environment of the, uh, the shuttle orbiter. We wanted to check out our suits and the life support systems on the back that we call EMUs. We wanted to evaluate how we check them out before we take them into the airlock and depress and take them outside. We did have three suits on board. We wanted to look at our ability to move about in the payload bay, up and down the longerons or up and down the long distance of the payload bay, and across the bulkheads fore and aft. We wanted to look at our safety tether dynamics, the safety tether we wear to be sure that we stay connected uh, to the orbiter. We wanted to exercise various tools, winches, and in summary, <clears throat> our basic ability to do work, constructive type work or repair type work in the environment of the orbiter. Don here is back at the IUS tilt table. This is in the aft end. He's using a ratchet wrench here to uh, reposition some equipment. The story mentioned before, their, their practice run through of the IUS tilt table restow mechanism for which we have uh, an EVA procedure. That's just kind of a gee whiz thing. I tell you, this, this thing really does have a a Star Wars effect. 65 feet is a long way back, and that's a big vehicle, and it's still surprising. You look back, you're in orbit, you're in a spacecraft, and a damn thing has got wings and a tail. It just, it seems innocuous. And, and when those guys were in the back end of the vehicle, they were far enough away, and, and everything just absolutely silent. You know, you're gliding over the Earth uh, due to some, some fortunate magic, and, and they're back there having a heck of a good time in this case, and uh, it, it really does have, it's more Star Wars-y than Star Wars, I think. Except Star Wars spaceships have wings also. This is, as we were going down, we were 
we're fortunate here. That's the west coast of Mexico, just below Guadalajara, where it kind of bends from the southeast to the east-southeast. So we were zinging right along the Mexican coast, which has no significance except I think it makes for a nicer looking picture than if you had nothing down there. You notice on the fin, the rudder is offset to the left a little bit up there. That kind of surprised me, it turns out in talking to folks afterward that the flight control system checkout leaves the rudder parked to the left. And uh, it's nothing to be concerned about. That's just what it does. Now, those are all daylight scenes. Here are some with the, with the, uh, the film compensates for the, the lack of overall illumination in the, in the cargo bay. I think Story mentioned that uh, the helmet mounted lights were for all practical purposes, essential, and that the payload bay flood lighting was not adequate to do your tasks. Story here is using the uh, EVA winch that uh, is utilized for several different tasks. This is on the Ford bulkhead, and it's routed down to, he just pointed to an extra genie down there, which is used only to provide a load on the, uh, on the line that we use. Here we're doing some suit mobility checks, kind of uh, uh, reach envelope determination, suit stability and mobility evaluation, seeing if there were any objectionable uh, lockups in, uh, in any of the, the bearings. See if you could put it in one position where you wanted it, keep it there, so-called neutral point. performance of the EMUs was just like the performance of the vehicle. It was, uh, we've had some bad starts, but uh, they all, they both work like champs in this particular evolution. And we're very gratified by that also. This is getting back into the airlock. Turns out we have a little work to do on, uh, the term story used is choreographing this evolution. And that, that's a very good term, I think is that uh, as far as our procedures for getting out of and into the airlock. This is on the last day of the flight when we had our impromptu uh, conversation with the vice president. And we decided we were uh, notified during the flight that we had the dubious distinction of, uh, of being the an average age, the oldest crew to ever fly, anytime, anywhere. These were taken from the TV photo chase on return to Edwards. You can see the weather was as good out there for entry as it was at, uh, in Florida for the launch. This is through the HUD, through the head-up display. The HUD was a tremendous asset, I feel, toward making what subjectively, from, uh, from an operator's point of view, what, that I thought was a, a relatively smooth approach and landing. Here we are in a flare. Preparation for landing. This almost counts as a carrier landing, as you'll see in the next photo, by an overwater approach here. <laughs> Edward Dry Lake Bay. Right. Uh, we felt a little turbulence, one gust on final, on the final approach, and it just sailed right through it with, with no crew response necessary. Uh, the touchdown was nominal. Uh, from my standpoint, anyway, relatively smooth. I didn't hear any gasps, so you guys might all have been holding your breath or something. Speed brakes are starting open. Our standard procedure, as soon as the main gear on deck, I call speed brakes open, and Bo manually opens the speed brakes to help impart some drag to it. <clears throat> but anyway, it, it's starting to come together, folks. The whole system is... Uh, I, we're on our way. It did feel good to be back on the ground again, even though it was a tremendously exhilarating experience, but that is just such a, 
a huge, impressive vehicle, especially when it's sitting on the ground. I cannot say from my own personal standpoint how pleased I was with the performance uh, of this vehicle. And I just can't say too much about this vehicle, which demonstrates to me the maturity of the entire shuttle program, the shuttle transportation system.